Hello learners, today we are going to do unit 3 of block 1 from American Drama and Introduction. Uh, this is thematic concerns in all my sons. So we are going to discuss and talk about all the theme related concerns that arise in this play. These are the objectives, introduction and then uh, again objectives here. Uh, let's start with the introduction. In All My Sons, we come across several themes. The theme of social responsibility is the single major theme, while there are several other themes juxtaposed with the major one. The relatively minor themes are interwoven in such a way with the major theme that they have become an integral part of the play. Uh, these uh, all the underlined parts are the notes. So you can write them down if you wish to. Or maybe if you ask me, I will create a PDF for it later and put it down in the description. Anyways, what the introduction says is that in my in all my sons in this play, we come across several themes. There are several themes into it. But the theme of social responsibility is the single major theme. It's the uh, biggest theme in this play. Uh, the theme of social responsibility. Uh, if you wish, you can and, uh, take note of this too. So while there are several other themes juxtaposed with the major one which is juxtaposed it means placed together for contrasting effect. So while there are several other themes juxtaposed with the major one. So while there are still uh, several other themes which are placed together with the major theme to bring out a contrast between these themes to bring out the difference between these different themes. And the relatively minor themes are still interwoven so they uh, wish to say that even though these themes are put together for contrasting effect to show how they are different from each other but still they are put together in such a way that they become uh, that they mix together with the major theme and become an integral part of the play rather than being separate entities so uh, these uh, themes they uh, they obviously look different they have uh, they show a contrasting effect but still if you read the play as a whole they seem to be interwoven with the play so they seem to become an integral part of the play integral means included as part of a whole rather than supplied separately so it comes uh, as a part of the play as a part of the play which is involved in the comp in the play rather than some separate entity theme of social responsibility now the play all my sons has a single major theme uh, that's why i didn't underline it before because it comes again that the play all my sons has a single major theme the theme the theme of social responsibility it emphasizes the importance of a man's duty towards society and his country before his duty to his family emphasize means uh, give special importance or value to so this theme the theme of social responsibility uh, give special importance to the uh, a man's uh, to the importance so it uh, focuses or it brings into contrast or it uh, highlights the importance of a man's duty towards society and his country before his duty to his family the play brings out the tragic consequences of a man's mistake of becoming rich and providing a comfortable and luxurious life to his family at the cost of society so this play is basically about how uh, uh, there are tragic consequences of a man's mistake of becoming rich so this man made the mistake of becoming rich at the cost of society to provide a comfortable and luxurious life to his family but le that led to very tragic consequences for him and his family so instead of living a good health and comfortable life he uh, he and his family had to face very tragic consequences had to live a very uncomfortable life joe keller wants to fulfill the american dream that goes back to the early puritan settlers in america so joe keller wants to fulfill the american dream and the american dream is as uh, old as the puritan settlers in america who were the who were the puritan settlers so the puritan settlers were english protestants of the late 8th 16th and 17th century so they were english protestants uh, like you know there are two kinds of christians uh, catholics and orthodox so these were english protestants uh, this was also a group of uh, uh, group of uh, Christians, the Protestants, and these were of the late 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, they uh, who regarded the reformation of the church under Elizabeth I as incomplete. Uh, and sought to simplify and regulate forms of worship. So they regarded the reformation of the church. Under Elizabeth, there was a reformation of the church. If you do not know, let me tell you about it before. 
so in the mid, uh, mid to late 16th century there was a deep catholic protestant yeah these uh, actually now the groups are like orthodox christian or catholic christians but uh, earlier there were these two groups mainly catholic uh, christians and protestant christians so the protestants were like i believe uh, they believed in the old god so i don't know there are several differences in there you can check them online there's not a simple uh, single simple distinction that you can say that uh, uh, the catholics believed in this or protestant believes in this they have different set uh, a little bit uh, difference in their set of practices but they believe in the same god obviously because there cannot be two uh, christian uh, two christ sorry there cannot be two christ so they believe in the same god but there are some difference in their practices so in the mid late to in the mid to late 16th century there was a deep catholic protestant divide in england elizabeth uh, was a protestant and she attempted to convert her entire country into protestant christians this policy resulted in her excommunication from the catholic church in 1570 so elizabeth one was a protestant and she tried to convert the entire country of christians into protestant christians and this led to her excommunication from the catholic church in 1570 and the people who uh, protested against this were basically uh, the puritan settlers so they regarded this uh, reformation of the church under elizabeth as incomplete and they sought to simplify and regulate the forms of worship so they believed that uh, this reformation that was brought uh, by elizabeth 1 was incomplete and they wanted to uh, simplify the form of worship so uh, these people uh, these people came with the aim to establish new jerusalem that practically meant establishing an economic civilization in the wilderness of american continent so what they are saying is that these people also uh, uh, i just told you about who the puritan settlers were now what uh, how uh, this american dream is related to the puritan settlers is that the early puritan settlers in america it means that the in america these puritan settlers came to establish uh, their uh, family or their uh, life there so they came to settle in america and what was their aim there was to uh, their aim was to establish new jerusalem that practically meant establishing an economic civilization in the wilderness of american continent so let's say that you discovered some new place then some people go out there to settle so you must have a plan in mind now like uh, we want to settle uh, we want to settle in this way or in that way we want to establish this kind of society that kind of society uh, from now on our goal will be this or we will form these organizations or we will work in this way so in the same manner these puritan settlers uh, these puritan people who went into america to settle when the continent was discovered they had a, an aim in mind and their aim was to establish new jerusalem new jerusalem uh, means it was a kind of idea of uh, establishing an economic civilization because america was very wild uh, the native indians lived there as you very well know so it was a wild place so they wanted to establish an economic civilization in this wild place uh so you can see that the american dream for money american dream of economic uh, prosperity dates back to uh, the uh, dates back to the very foundation of america it dates back to the very times when america was discovered in due course of time however the achievement of the success was through manipulation and disregard for moral values so uh, when these people came they obviously didn't think that we'll uh, do all kinds of bad things illegal things to achieve our aim they obviously thought that we'll work hard we'll uh, will uh, work hard will uh, work in harmony and together we will form a very uh, big very prosperous economic civilization but over time uh, to achieve quick success uh, to achieve uh, painless success you can say without working hard uh, people started uh, doing manipulation and disregarding moral values just like it happens in every society so keller merely believes in the economic interpretation of the american so this came to be known as the american dream the dream for money the dream for economic prosperity and uh, there were two phases to it however uh, economic prosperity through right and moral means and obviously there's economic prosperity through immoral means so keller merely believes in the economic interpretation of the american dream where values and morality take the back seat so they're saying here values and morality take the back seat uh, let me and furthermore joe keller's dream is confined to his family his ultimate goal being to look after the comforts of his family this obsession makes him dupe his own friend and partner steve deaver
sorry, I didn't tell you about excommunication. I guess last time there's a new word excommunication. If you remember, I just told you that uh, Elizabeth one was uh, excommunicated from the Catholic Church in the 1570. So excommunication means the action of officially excluding someone from participating in the sacraments and services of the Christian Church. It's a very good word. I think you should remember it. And sacrament is a religious ceremony or ritual regarded as imparting divine grace such as baptism. And baptism, if you don't know, it's a Christian religious rite of sprinkling water on a person's forehead. Or you can say immersing them in water sometimes, symbol, which symbolizes purification. So, uh, moving back to the topic at hand, this obsession makes him dupe his own friend and partner Steve Dever, as we very well know. Dupe means deceive or trick. He is inspired by the myopic vision of the American dream. We have discussed this many times before, the short-sighted vision, the immediate vision of the American dream. This meant to become successful by manipulation and duplicity. So, like I told you, there are uh, basically two versions of the American dream or you can interpret in two ways by gaining economic prosperity through moral means or beginning prosperity through moral means. So, the myopic vision of the American dream basically signifies uh, being successful through manipulation and duplicity. Uh, he believes that to survive in this world of competition, one has to be successful alone as do many other people too. The fear of failure leads him to betray not only his friend but also his own country. Again, let me tell you these uh, green highlighted uh, words are actually your notes. So if you wish you can write them down. Joe Keller, a manufacturer of aircraft engines, had received an urgent contract from the army to supply cylinder heads for aircrafts to be used in war. I don't know how many times I've read all this but uh, they just keep on repeating it. So I guess it's a kind of better. Uh, you can... Uh, practice it again and again reading it again will eventually make you remember all this stuff but it so happened that the whole batch of cylinder heads produced by the manufacturing units had developed cracks on the day the urgent order came joe keller was at home while his business partner steve dever was in the manufacturing unit steve dever called up joe keller to inform him about the hairline cracks in the cylinder heads discovered by him in the factory Joe Keller could have asked Steve Dever to withhold the supply of these defective cylinder heads. So he's saying that Joe Keller could have asked him, could have asked Steve Dever that you shouldn't pass on the defective cylinder heads, just keep them here, or inform the army that we don't have uh, working or using usable cylinder heads. But instead, what did he do? Uh, but he felt that putting a halt to the supply of the damaged cylinder heads would lead to huge financial loss. So he figured out that if you put a halt on the supply of these damaged cylinder heads, then I would suffer a huge loss. So why should I do it? Let the people die. I don't care. 120 defective cylinder heads. You can possibly imagine that 120 defective cylinder heads is a very large amount. So if basically uh, it's like he had all, all of the batch of his cylinder heads were basically uh, useless. So if he didn't make use of them, if he didn't sell them, he would practically go bankrupt. Because he had to obviously put a lot of amount. So uh, let's say that you started some factory. And uh, you put all your money into producing smartphones. And all the batch of smartphones that came out had some defect in them. So if you won't be able to sell them, all of that money went to waste, right? And you would lose your factory. You won't have, uh, you don't have money to again start producing that, uh, that many amount of smartphones. Or again start producing uh, such a big batch of uh, goods. So this is what happened with Joe Keller. So if he didn't uh, get on with these uh, cylinder heads, then he would lose such a huge financial loss that he would practically go bankrupt. 120 defective cylinder heads that the factory had manufactured were damaged and discarding them and making new ones would lead to a lot of delay as also to the termination of their contract. Moreover, they would not be able to meet the demands of the army who needed the cylinder heads immediately for the ongoing war. So, owing to the financial pressure, basically this is the line that owing to the financial pressure and the obsession of becoming rich, Keller risked shipping the faulty parts of the cylinder heads. Now, he shipped basically about a hundred 
or a hundred and twenty cylinder heads, but only twenty one of them were so defective that they led to uh, the death of the pilots. So I guess you were thinking before that uh, he's saying that the army would be short of cylinder heads, or uh, they wouldn't be able to fulfill the demands of the armies uh, for cylinder heads. But even if they do ship these cylinder heads, still they do not meet the uh, demand of the army because these cylinder heads are basically useless and they led to the death of pilots. But not all of them were useless some of them were useless and uh, they couldn't identify which would be uh, which would uh, uh, give up during the war or which one can hold it up till the last time so that's why out of the 120 cylinders only 21 came out turned out to be so defective that they led to the death of the pilots so as still even one life is counted for so they shouldn't have shipped the cylinders the same thing but still he did it who cares Keller could not bear to see his business collapse that had taken 40 years of struggle to build it. Keeping his personal and family interest in mind, he called up Steve Dever asking him to weld the cracks on the cylinders and ship it out to the army. Keller told him that he was down with the flu and would not be coming to the factory. So Keller basically told Steve Dever that I have flu and I can't come to the factory. So you just weld the cylinder heads and ship them off. But and I'll take the responsibility if anything happens would not be coming to the factory but would take full responsibility for supplying the damaged cylinders. Later defending his action, Keller tells his son that he thought that the authorities would send him a report of the damaged cylinder heads after they themselves had tested it. So Kate, uh, Keller later tells his son that I thought that the authorities would test the cylinder heads and then report them back to me whether they were usable or not. 21 pilots is just a kind of uh, excuse. 21 pilots were dead in consequence as the aircrafts crashed. Both Steve Dever and Joe Keller knew that the defective cylinder heads would put the lives of the pilots in danger, but they wanted to make profit without bothering about the consequences. So here Steve Dever is at fault too. Steve Dever does not come out completely clean because he too knew that this would put the uh, pilots at risk and as a fellow human being, he too didn't uh, try to stop uh, Keller. Even if uh, Keller was the boss or see Keller was the one who instructed him to do things. He had some kind of moral value. He had some kind of moral sense inside him. So he should have instead tried to uh, stop Keller too. But somewhere deep inside he had this urge too. He, has this he had this motive too to become rich. So he just listened to Keller. It was an excuse for Steve Dever to do uh, what he already wanted to do. You can say he already wanted to becoming uh, to become rich and he wanted to obviously weld the cylinder head and ship them anyway. But Keller saying all this gave him an excuse to do it. Uh, for Joe Keller, the duty uh, towards his family is his priority. He makes a wrong choice and the result is disastrous. Keller insists that his own values are those of the American capitalist society that emphasis, emphasizes achieving success by economic gain in this land of opportunity. So Keller insists that his own values are similar to the American capitalist society. He is not someone, uh, he is not some kind of monster and he is not some kind of a very different, uh, a very uh, cruel person, horrible person. He is the same as everyone else uh, because his values are very similar to the American capitalist society and it emphasizes achieving success by economic gain in this land of opportunity so he's basically saying that i had this opportunity and i made use of it to make gain economic success as he asks who worked for nothing in that war when they work for nothing i'll work for nothing did they ship a gun or a truck out of detroit before they got their prize is that clear it's dollars and cents nickels and dimes war and peace it's nickels and dimes what's clear Half the goddamn country's gotta go if I go. Joe Keller places his commitment to his immediate family above his wider responsibility to the society at large. So for Joe Keller, his immediate family, immediate here means his nearby, his uh, directly related family is uh, his main priority and not his uh, bigger family or not the society at large. He does not care about his responsibility towards the society. So that was the theme of social responsibility. Now we're moving on to the theme of uh, the problem of Chris marriage. Problem of Chris marriage as theme. Chris. It's not Chris's. It's Chris. Just Chris. 
One of the minor themes of the play is the problem of Chris's marriage. Kate Keller is of the view that her son Larry would return someday from the war that had ended three years ago, as we very well know. Keller, uh, sorry, Larry went to the war as a fighter pilot and had been reported missing. For all practical purposes, he was presumed to be dead. So he was thought to be dead for all practical purposes because he didn't come back for three years from the war. And there were obviously such situations in the war where someone could die. Steve Deaver's daughter, Steve Deaver, who's, uh, who was Joe Keller's partner, Steve Deaver's daughter Anne had been in love with Larry and was engaged to him before he went to fight in the war. But after the news of Larry going missing, Anne had accepted the fact that he was no more. So she duped Larry and went off with his brother Chris. Yo. With Larry, uh, Anne had accepted the fact that he was no more. Larry's brother Chris is in love with Anne. After his brother was reported to be killed in the war, Chris desires to marry Anne. He keeps in touch with her through letters and later invites her to his house in order to propose to her. Anne comes to the Keller household in response to Chris's invitation and agrees to marry him. Their idyllic setup gets dis uh, disturbed with Chris's invitation to Anne to visit the Keller household. So idyllic means extremely happy or peaceful. So their extremely happy or peaceful setup gets disturbed with Chris's invitation to Anne to visit the Keller household. So they had this thing going on they exchanged letters for like two years so they had a very extremely happy a very peaceful cooperation with each other a very good relation a very happy relationship with each other but all of this gets dips disturbed when chris finally invites n to visit the keller household as we very well know because kate is against it initially uh, joe keller is against it then george comes out george is against it so basically everyone is going against their decision and the idyllic setup they had that, uh, that they had this thing going on that they were in love with each other they exchanged happy thoughts now they were turning to a little bit of bitter thoughts uh, the arrival of end to the keller household opens up several questions that had been left unanswered for three years leading to the downfall of keller and the collapse of the keller family her arrival after a long interval connects the present with the past and actions with consequences now, ironically, there's a theme in their uh, actions and their consequences. While everyone in the Keller household believes that Larry is dead, Kate persists in believing that Larry is alive and would come home one day. Persist means continue in an opinion or course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. So, uh, despite opposition, Kate... Uh, uh, Kate uh, continues on in believing that Larry is alive and he would be back home one day. Joe Keller knows Chris's intention of inviting Anne home. But he tells Chris that uh, no, your mother would not agree to this marriage because she believes that her son Larry is still alive and Anne is Larry's fiance. Kate is already suspicious of Anne's arrival to her house. So, I mean, like... Uh, Larry died like say three years ago and and hadn't visited their home for two three years like this and then she suddenly comes home uh, to visit them so they were uh, suspicious that maybe Kate uh, maybe Anne and Chris are in love and that's why Anne is here to get acquainted to them again and uh, maybe put this proposal in front of them that we want to marry so Kate is already suspicious of Anne's arrival to her house and when she learns that Chris wants to marry Anne she does not approve of it as for her to agree to their marriage would mean the confirmation of Larry's death, which in turn would prove her husband's complicity in the crime of killing 21 pilots. So complicity means the fact or condition of being involved with others in an activity that is unlawful or morally wrong. So uh, it would prove that her husband was involved in the crime of killing 21 pilots. Basically complicity means involved in some kind of illegal crime or uh, involved in some kind of crime or illegal activity you can say. However N is willing to marry Chris as she is convinced that Larry is dead. The apple tree that had fallen down by the fierce wind. We know that the apple tree fold, fell down because of the storm. So, the apple tree that had fallen down by the fierce wind on the day of Anne's arrival reinforces her belief that the coincidence has some hidden meaning, uh, like a kind of omen. 
So Kate refuses to agree with both Chris and Anne's firm view that Larry is dead. The arrival of George in the Keller household further complicates the situation. Now again then George comes on and this again complicates the situation even more. George had come to the Keller household, Keller household to prevent his sister's marriage to Chris after he learnt about certain facts about the case in which his father had been convicted. So George uh, came comes to know about some certain facts about his father's case and then he visits the Keller household. And Keller uh, about certain facts in which his father had been convicted and Keller had been exonerated after meeting his father in prison in Columbus. So he went off. Uh, Keller had been exonerated from this case. Exonerate means absolve someone officially from blame or fault. So Keller was, uh, uh, you can say, absolved of the blame. He was uh, given a clean shit, basically. So uh, George went to Columbus to visit his father in prison and there he comes to know about certain facts about Joe Keller and his father's case. And upon uh, this, upon this re new revelation to him, he comes to visit the Joe Kellers, uh, to visit the Kellers household. On arrival at the Keller household, George takes up the matter in order to expose, uh, expose Keller's complicity in the case. He tells his sister Anne that he would not allow her to marry Chris, the son of a man who ruined their father's life. So now uh, George believes, George completely believes his father. He is of the opinion that Joe Keller was in fact the main culprit and uh, using some dirty tricks he got himself out. So obviously he wouldn't let his marry uh, his sister marry uh, the son of such a man who ruined their father's life. He ruined their own life, their very existence. Kate wants Anne to leave with George because she still believes that Larry is alive and Anne should wait for Larry's return. Chris makes it clear that Anne would not leave the house and that he would marry Anne because Larry is dead. So like uh, now there's a kind of three-way, two-way fight between them. George is of the opinion that no, Anne would not marry uh, Chris. And then uh, Kate is of the opinion that Anne would, uh, would not marry Chris because Anne should marry Larry. And then Chris and Larry wants to marry each other anyways. So basically uh, everyone is just against their marriage in, sh in short. Kate says that Larry is alive and if everyone believes he is dead then he has been killed by his father. I don't know where this comes from. She says that a father never kills his son, so Larry must be alive. Maybe she already knew that Larry felt guilty about his father and committed suicide. Maybe she knew she had an idea about this. I don't know. But she certainly links uh, Larry's death to his father's crime, to Joe Keller's crime. She says that a father never kills his son, so Larry must be alive. In spite of knowing that Larry is dead, Kate lives in self-deception that Larry will return to justify her conviction. She adopts a blind faith in religion and obstinately argues that God does not let a son be killed by his father. Obstinately means uh, stubbornly refusing to change one's opinion or chosen course of action. So she stubbornly refused to change her opinion about this and argues that God does not let a son be killed by his father and therefore Larry has to be alive. In order to justify that he has not killed Larry, Keller says that Larry could not have been killed by engine failure because he was not flying a P-40 aeroplane but some other aeroplane and the faulty cylinder heads were only for the P-40 aeroplanes. Chris is suspicious about his father's role in the supply of damaged cylinder heads and asks him whether he was responsible for the death of the other pilots. Keller tries to hide the fact from his son Chris but reveals the truth when Chris threatens to tear him to pieces. Keller admits his guilt, saying that if the cylinder heads had not been shipped out to the army, he would have become bankrupt. To save his factory from ruin, he had no choice but to supply the defective cylinder heads to the army. He says that he had visualized the repercussions. A uh, repercussion means a, uh, a remote or indirect consequence of some action. So he says that I had already imagined the action, uh, the action, sorry, the consequence, the consequence of my action. But he thought that the army would check before bringing them into use and report to him about their malfunctions, if any. 
Shocked by his father's argument to defend himself, Chris shouts at him for having endangered the lives of 21 pilots. Chris feels miserable and helpless at the crime his father has committed. Chris wants to move out to earn his own living away from his parents. He refuses to be part of the fraud by living on the profit of his father's business made by wrong means. Now, in this end offers to accompany Chris that we'll live together, we'll work together and uh, live a happy life together. But Chris refuses this because he's not sure that he can take care of N and whether and he should marry N now because uh, basically his own father was the result why N's father was in jail and her life had been miserable or maybe worse than it uh, should have been. So N offers to accompany Chris but he refuses to take her along because Kate has made Chris feel guilty of marrying N. Kate objects to N's marriage with Chris saying that he will ha have to wait for Larry to return and if Chris married N, he would always be unhappy because he would be feeling guilty all the time that he had married a girl belonging to Larry. So you can basically say that Chris is kind of feeling guilty for marrying and you know there's a lot of things going on he gets to realize that uh, his own father was the reason for the death of all those pilots he's maybe feeling for sorry, sorry for Larry too his brain is you know some uh, his kind of in a sad emotional cloud. So is uh, at this time too is feeling guilty of marrying and he listens to his mother he's kind of thinks you know sometimes you think that maybe I sh don't deserve anything maybe I don't deserve any happiness maybe I don't deserve this girl like this so that's why he's kind of feel getting feel uh, feeling guilty for N. N emphatically says emphatically means in a forceful way. N emphatically says that Larry died after his airplane crashed off the coast of China on the 25th of November, which was not due to engine failure. Refusing to believe her, Kate accuses N of lying, that you're lying, lying scheming girl. In order to save her relationship with Chris, N shows Kate the letter from Larry himself, a proof of his death that he had written to her on the last day of his life. Kate was not shocked by the letter for she already knew the truth. Kate, Chris also had a vague idea about his father's crime. Kate on one hand could not accept the death of her son Larry as this would lead her husband's guilt to be proved. Chris on the other hand did not want to accept his father's crime as he had idolized and respected him. So both actually had an idea about the crime. Chris, Kate actually in reality knew of uh, Joe Keller's crime and Chris had a vague idea too but none of them wanted to believe it none of them wanted to uh, give it uh, to focus on it because uh, they were just living in kind of self-deception self-denial kind of thing both of them uh, Chris uh, in the letter Larry had written to N that he had come to know through the newspaper of his father being convicted for supplying defective cylinder heads that had killed a large number of pilots. Ashamed of his father's crime, he was ending his life by letting his aircraft to crash. Such a sad story. Anne Deaver also had been living in denial after she received Larry's letter. She knew about Keller's guilt but does not reveal to anyone until she is compelled to do so to save her relationship with Chris. So you can say that through the letter basically N2 uh, knew or had a very good idea of Keller's crime, Joe Keller's crime, but she doesn't want to reveal it, say it to anyone so she can have a happy relationship with Chris. Now, idealism as theme. Another minor theme juxtaposed, juxtaposed, placed together for contrasting effect. Another minor theme juxtaposed with the main theme in the play, All My Sons, is the theme of idealism. This is a minor theme. Chris has an idealistic bent of mind. So Chris has an idealistic bent of mind. He feels guilty in even wanting to marry N and settling down to lead a blissful and comfortable life. Blissful means extremely happy or full of joy. So he feels guilty in settling down with N, marrying her and living a comfortable life while all the men under his command have been killed in the course of the war. These soldiers had repeatedly proved by their actions that they were real human beings. Chris feels guilty of having survived the war while the other soldiers died. 
He tries to console himself by thinking that the soldiers under his command were sacrificing their lives for a noble cause. So he tries to console himself uh, that the soldiers died because they were uh, doing this for the greater good. They were doing this for some noble cause. In his opinion, by giving up their lives, these soldiers were helping in changing the world into a better place. But when the war ended and he came back home, he saw to his shock that nothing had changed in the world around him. He found the same kind of selfishness, competition to make money and the desire to fulfill the American dream as he had observed before the war. So we're the war, the war, the war, we keep on talking about the war, we're talking about the world war. I think it was uh, World War One, maybe. I don't know. It was World War One, World War Two. They're talking about. Uh, I guess it was World War One, though. If you wish, you can search it up online. So he thinks that uh, we are fighting this war so we can be f- uh, free from all the un- uh, all the bad people in this world. Every country believes that the con- other country they are fighting is bad and they are uh, doing some good for humanity. So that's why they fight obviously. So he was thinking something sim- on the similar lines that he is fighting this war to free the world of bad people, of bad practices. Uh, but then he is saying that when he comes back home, he finds out that the same selfishness, the same competition to make money and, to, and the desire to fulfill the American dream is going on everywhere around him as he had observed before the war. So the war basically didn't change anything. The conditions that were before the war are still after the war. The existing situation makes Chris feel guilty. So uh, obviously he is now thinking. Then what did all the soldiers try for? What did we? Uh, hurt, why did we hurt ourselves? Why did we have to go through all those difficulties if nothing was going to change at all? So the existing situation makes Chris feel guilty for the people who had given their lives in vain, uh, as nothing had changed in the world. Vain means unproductive of success, fruitless, in a fruitless way, futile. Chris felt, uh, felt ashamed of everything around him. He was ashamed of looking at his checkbook, of driving his new car or looking at the new fridge that was bought for the house. He feels awkward to use his comforts and is also hesitant to marry Anne. So why is he hesitant and uh, awkward, feels awkward, ashamed of doing all these things? It's because he feels that even he shouldn't have been alive. His brothers all died. They're now in a place. They cannot use these things. They cannot leave. Uh, they cannot be uh, live this comfortable life. And he feels guilty of it. That now he is living all this life at the expense of their lives. That they died. They all died to give him this kind of comfort. This uh, this kind of life. In the war, he had seen men having a bonding among themselves, while here people were driven by their selfish motives. Uh, okay, motive. So, Chris idealistic, Chris's, I, or you can say it, Chris's, Chris's idealistic personality influences Jim Bayliss. Jim Bayliss is the doctor. To such an extent that he wants to give up his medical practice for medical research. The idea of medical research upsets his wife Sue, who accuses Chris of misleading her husband and filling his ma- mind with wrong notions. Notion means a cus- conception of or belief about something. So basically you can say a belief, a wrong belief. So medical research had given immense satisfaction to Jim, making that particular period of life much happier. Uh, but it didn't give out much money because during medical research you actually have to give out money from your own pockets many times and you don't get money medical in medical practice you get money but medical practice was not to jim's liking medical research was but medical research was not to sue's liking because it didn't uh, let them have a very comfortable and good life so, medical research had given immense satisfaction to Jim making that particular period of his life much happier, but he had to discontinue with his research to please his life, Sue, for whom materialistic comforts mattered more. Chris says, the business, the business doesn't inspire me. It is against his ideology to enter his father's business that had been built by fraudulent means. He fears that he might follow the success code of society. 
Chris idealistic qualities even compel his father, force his father to realize the enormity of his crime of killing 21 pilots. Joe Keller is forced by Chris' idealism to realize his social responsibilities. In result, he kills himself as a punishment for his crime of being involved with killing 21 pilots. Now, uh, moving on to father-son relationship as theme. Another minor theme interwoven with the main theme in the play All My Sons is father-son relationship. So, another minor theme is the father-son relationship here. Keller says, There's nothing he could do that I wouldn't forgive because he's my son. Because I'm his father and he's my son. Nothing bigger than that. I'm his father and he's my son. And if there's something bigger than that, I'll put a bullet in my head. Chris has a high opinion of his father, Joe Keller. He considers him an infallible father figure. Infallible means incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. He is very close to him and has complete trust in him. Keller is the first person in whom Chris confides his marriage plans with N. Confide means tell a secret or tell something secret. Uh, you can basically just take it out. Here. Confide, reveal in private, tell confidential, confidentially. His marriage plans with N. Chris convinces his father to support him in the fight that involves uh, Kate, who still thinks of N as Larry's fiance. Joe Keller does not want to interfere in the complex matter, however. Because he thinks that Chris's marriage is his own affair and he is also worried that his wife Kate would not like the idea of Chris marrying Larry's fiancé. So obviously he loves his wife and doesn't want to see her being unhappy. Keller is a friend more than a father to Chris. So Keller is more uh, like a kind of friend than a father to him. Giving him friendly advice, Keller says that Chris should first take Anne's opinion in planning his marriage. Confiding with him, Chris says that from the letters he had been receiving from Anne, he thinks that uh, she has forgotten Larry completely. Chris expects him to take his side if his mother refuses to allow the marriage. So Chris is saying that uh, Chris expects his father that his father tries to uh, uh, tries to talk Kate, uh, Kate <gasps> sorry, that is Chris's mother into accepting their marriage. Threatening to leave the house and live somewhere else if he is not given consent to marry her. So he's saying, uh, so he threatens them that I will leave the house if I am not allowed to marry her. Keller is shocked to hear his decision to quit home. He is worried about their family business that he had built for Chris. So he built all that family business for Chris, for Chris and now he's worried about that he might not take the business at all. He might not run this business. Chris blackmails his father uh, saying that he would stay back to take charge of the family business only if he's allowed to marry Anne. So this was uh, Joe Keller's biggest wish that his uh, son takes charge of his business. And now he's saying that I will fulfill your biggest wish if you fulfill my biggest wish. Or you can say if you fulfill my this wish. I don't know if it's his biggest wish, uh, wish at all. Chris refuses to believe that his father is guilty when Anne tells Chris that she heard from Sue that the neighbors think that Joe Keller has manipulated in the case of supplying defective cylinder heads to the army. So Chris does not believe that his father could be guilty when Anne tells him that uh, Sue and the other neighbors and the other neighbors still think that uh, Keller is guilty. Defending his father, he says he would never have forgiven his father if his father had been found guilty of fraud. Chris trusts his father and tells Anne that he is innocent in the case and was falsely accused. The arrival of Anne's brother George gives rise to conflict between Chris and Keller. Chris and Joe Keller because obviously Chris is Keller too. Keller is the surname. Revealing the truth, George says that Keller is the main culprit in the damaged cylinder head case and had deceived Steve Deaver. Chris objects strongly to George's accusation of his father. So Chris denies all these accusations. He's uh, having duped his uh, Joe Keller. Sorry, where were we? Objects strongly to George's accusation of his father having duped his partner Steve Deaver. George says that the court had passed the judgment without knowing the cunningness of Joe Keller. But Chris defends him saying he knows his father very well and that Joe Keller is not guilty. 
Chris again blatantly denies George's. So blatantly means in an open and unashamed manner. So Chris again openly denies George's accusation of his father being responsible for supplying defective slender heads. When George asks for Chris's permission to talk to Keller, Chris asserts that his father has done nothing wrong. Yeah, one more thing is that the right way to write, write Chris is this one here. This. Uh, let me mark it up. This. This is the right way to write Chris's. Means Chris K or Chris Key. Not the previous one. Chris asserts that his father has done nothing wrong and he knows what reply his father would give to his questions. Coming under pressure from George, Chris breaks the semblance for family harmony. Semblance means the outward appearance or apparent form of something, especially when the reality is different. So from outside, they were maintaining a kind of image, a kind of form that, yeah, we are happy, we are living a good life, everything is good with us. So Chris breaks this false image in order, uh, in order to satisfy George and his accusations. Uh, he comes under pressure from George. For family harmony maintained all this while questioning his father Keller about his role in the sordid business transaction. Sordid means involving immoral or dishonest actions. Uh, justifying himself. So Keller here tells the truth to George and but justifying himself he says that financial pressure and his duty towards his family compelled forced him to supply the damaged cylinder parts. The relation between father and son collapses with the clash of their principles. Joe Keller believes that nothing is bigger than uh, bigger in the world than one's family and nothing is more important than a son's relationship with the father. Justifying his actions, Keller tries to convince Chris saying, Chris, Chris, I did it for you. It was a chance and I took it for you. I'm 61 years old. When would I have another chance to make something for you? 61 years old, you don't get another chance, do you? Chris has a different set of idols. In his view, there is a larger world outside his family and one has a certain responsibility beyond one's family. In Chris's opinion, all the pilots killed in the war were also his sons. So Chris and Joe Keller have different idols, have different opinions, have, uh, they have different beliefs. In his view, in Chris's view, there is a larger world outside the family and one has a certain responsibility even beyond one's family. In Chris's opinion, all the pilots killed in the war were also his sons. Defending himself of his actions, Keller says that he has supplied the defective cylinder heads to the army to save himself from bankruptcy. He did not want to be out of his business, which had taken him 40 years to build. You can already imagine how important his business must have been. He invested... Uh, time worth 40 years into this business he must have invent, uh, invested so much amount of money into it so much amount of pain and uh, desperation and all those kinds of feelings and emotions into that business to make it happen and then he just had to let it all go because of one failed transaction so obviously you can say how how his situation was how difficult it was for Joe Keller, but still, uh, you have to make the right decision even in different, even in difficult circumstances. He did not want to be out of his business, which had taken him 40 years to build. He was already 61 and was in no position to build up another business if he allowed his business to collapse. He says he did all this for Chris's sake to protect his future interest and to ensure his family's survival. Further defending his actions, Joe Keller says that there was no harm making money and that everyone else earned money by all possible methods during the war. Chris's character is contrary to his father's, uh, it's different from his father's character. Uh, the conflict between Chris and Joe Keller arises from Chris's consciousness to our social responsibility. So Chris is con con conscious of his social responsibility while Keller is insensibly following the American dream. So Keller does not know what's moral, what's immoral. He doesn't know what is right and how far should we go in following the American dream. He just has this one goal in his mind to become economically rich, to, be to follow this American dream. But he doesn't uh, follow it uh, rightfully. 
Chris is ashamed to know of his father's principles and says that he had always put his father on a high pedestal, but now he had fallen in his estimation. Chris says that he had judged Keller not as a man, but as his father. Chris is furious to hear from his father that he had put the pilot's life at stake for his family's sake. Chris had been risking his life daily, fighting in the war and had, been, uh, and had seen soldiers under his command at the war perishing daily while Keller had ignored the interest of the country and worked for his selfish motives. He lashes at him furiously. What the hell do you mean do you, you did it for me? Don't you have a country? You're not even an animal. No animal kills his own. What are you? Chris does not know how to punish Joe. He feels helpless and miserable. Larry's letter finally makes Keller realize that there is something bigger than the family. The letter reads that Larry could not live with the shame of his father being involved in the death of the pilots. Keller says, sure, he was my son. But I think to him they were all my sons. And I guess they were. I guess they were. So finally, letters, uh, Larry's letter make uh, Joe Keller realize of his mistake and he uh, says that sure he was my son but I think to him but now I think uh, that they were all my sons. So Keller punishes himself according to the family law. Just joking. Keller punishes himself by shooting himself on realizing that he was wrong in seeing only his family while both his sons Chris and Larry are right in seeing the larger family. Chris holds himself responsible for his father's self-destruction. So Chris thinks that because he made his father realize of his mistakes and because he forced his father to go to jail was the reason why his father killed himself. Keller wants to rename the business for Chris from J. O. Keller Incorporated to J. O. Keller and Son. But Chris is uneasy with the proposition. Keller suspects that Chris is ashamed of their money. So he tries to convince Chris that he, I have earned all this money morally with good rightful means. Unlike the Chris Keller relationship, George's relationship with his father uh, improves from callousness. Callousness means insensitive and cruel disregard. Disregard means paying no attention to or ignoring. So he had been crueling in a very cruel manner, ignoring his father, being insensitive towards his father's problems. Uh, George was. And uh, from that kind of position to it moves to that of a dutiful son as the play proceeds. George disowns his father Steve Dever thinking him to be the main culprit in the defective cylinder case. He snaps his relationship with his father as he himself is an idealist like Chris who cannot tolerate his father's involvement in the crime of killing 21 pilots while working on his personal profit and looking after the welfare of his family. George comes to know about the truth after this after his meeting with his father in the prison where he went to inform of his Chris marriage with Anne. So this was the first time that George went to uh, visit uh, his father Steve Dever in Columbus. And this was also the time when uh, George uh, re uh, finally realizes the truth about the Slender's case. Convinced by his father's version of the case, he visits the Keller household to expose the Keller's crime and prevent Anne's marriage with Chris. George's accusations against Keller are rejected by the Keller family and also by Anne herself. Though George does not succeed in convincing them, the sincere efforts of a dutiful son do bring disturbance to the peaceful existence of the Keller family. So now a little bit of break and then we'll start again. Now moving on to actions and their consequences as theme. Another theme that is integrated with the main theme is actions and their consequences. Joe Keller, manufacturer of aircraft cylinder heads, had been charged with the supplying of defective equipment that led to the death of 21 pilots as we already know by now. So many times it's been repeated. It was his decision to ship the faulty cylinder heads to the army yet he denies his responsibility for his actions at the trial and the blame shift to Steve Deaver, his partner. This also we know. While his partner is convicted, he is exonerated, thus re-establishing his business successfully and winning back the respect of his neighbors. Despite suspicions that he is guilty, they apparently accept him back in their social life, but relief at his acquittal lasts only for three years. At the time the play begins, and the daughter of Steve Deaver arrives at the Keller household to get married to Chris Keller. 
Kate refuses to allow the marriage between Chris and Anne as agreeing to their marriage would mean that she has accepted the death of her son Larry, with whom Anne was engaged. Acceptance of her son's death would also mean linking Larry's death with her husband's guilt. Keller is nervous and frightened once he gets to know that George, who is a lawyer now, uh, maybe this was not uh, told to us before, but George is a lawyer, was on his way to the Keller household after visiting his father, Steve Deaver, in jail. George's arrival to the Kellers further complicates matters as he comes to the Kellers to know the truth of the defective surrender case. So, Keller was already suspicious of George's arrival when George called them or when he came to New Jersey, George went to Columbus to meet with Steve Deaver. He was already very suspicious that uh, George must have gone there to inquire about the case again. Or when he uh, uh, proposed to visit the Keller household, Kellers were almost sure that George wants to reopen the case. And therefore, even uh, Chris's mother, Kate, had asked him to protect both of them if something like that happens. George... Uh, uh, from Joe Keller was on his way to the Keller household after visiting his father Steve Deaver in jail. George's arrival to the Kellers further complicates matters as he become as he comes to the Kellers to know the truth of the defective slender case, uh, slender case from Joe Keller. After visiting his father in jail, George now believes that Joe Keller is equally responsible for the death of the pilots. He wants Anne to break off the engagement with Chris and return with him to New York. Though he fails to get the facts out of Keller, Kate Keller accidentally lets out the secret by the slip of her tongue that Joe hasn't been laid up in 15 years. It basically means that Joe hasn't uh, stuck to bed for the past 15 years. Or you can, uh, in our common layman language, you can say that Joe hasn't been sick for the past 15 years. Uh, and the past 15 years includes the time of the case, of course. Because the case was about, uh, I guess, four years ago, around the time span of three to four years ago. This was the time of the case. And Kate now is saying that Joe hasn't been sick for in the past 15 years. So if Joe hasn't been sick in the past 15 years, then how? Uh, then why did he say that he has flu to Steve Deaver on the phone? Why did he say that? So it means that one of them is lying. Either George, ha uh, either J uh, Joe Keller has been sick, had been sick, or... Uh, Joe Keller was lying on the phone that I have flu and therefore I can't come to the job. So this is what catches George's attention too. In order to protect her husband from being proved guilty, she reiterates her faith in the theory of Larry being alive because if he is dead, Joe Keller has killed him and God does not let a son be killed by his father. I don't know why they're just sprouting this bullshit again and again. I don't know why, but even the, uh, the contrast is here. I mean... Uh, sorry, it's not the contrast. I don't know why they put this again. See, uh, she uh, accidentally said this, that he hasn't been laid up in 15 years. So she ex accidentally exposed Joe Keller. But instead of covering it up, she again starts saying that Larry is still alive because if Larry is not alive, then he's been killed by his father. I don't even know why where this comes from out of, out of nowhere. But retreats means say something again. Joe Keller has uh, Chris angrily confronts his father who tries hard to defend his actions as business. Justifying his acts, Keller explains that one works for 40 years and in one moment with one failed shipment, the contracts get cancelled and one loses everything. He had thought that the army would check the engine heads before bringing them into use and he would send him their reports. He would then warn them but it was too late and the disaster had already taken place. Chris is flabbergasted that his father knowingly put the lives of pilots at stake. Uh, flabbergasted means greatly surprised or astonished. Uh, Keller had acted put the lives of but his father says that he had done for Chris for his family and his business. Keller had acted within the profit orientation of capitalism. Wartime profiteering and the pursuit of business profit beyond humanity was part of the American capitalist system and Keller was one of thousands of men caught up in the existing situation, making a choice according to his own values. Keller works for the interests of the family, otherwise he would have lost his business and his family would have landed in poverty. All of this we already know, so I am just reading it again and you can uh, mark the notes here. 
and write it down. Chris is disgusted and ashamed of his father's choice, ignoring the larger social and cultural values. Larry's letter that is revealed by Anne, after she fears that her relation with Chris is threatened, brings out Larry's intention of committing suicide because of her father's actions. Stunned by the consequence of his actions that have led his son Larry to commit suicide and the guilt of killing the pilots and finally understanding that in the eyes of Larry and in the penalty of for his actions. So, stunned by the consequences of actions. So, uh, basically they're saying that Joe Keller was stunned, surprised by the consequences of what he had done and that his actions led to Larry's death, led to Larry committing suicide and the guilt of killing the pilot suit that who again took over and finally understanding it in the eyes of Larry and in the penalty of uh, in the penalty it's just messed up, it's written wrong here they, this don't make sense so you know and in a and in a panel in a the this up to here it's wrong this is wrong okay Keller's decision to commit suicide at the end of the play comes as a direct response to his realization that the pilots who died as a consequence of his actions were all his sons oh, oh god I don't know why, why why this line is not coming. It's only changing the color. Okay, I'm gonna use this. Hey, come on, okay, okay, man. This is so annoying. Strike through here. Okay. Now, strike through. Shit, whatever. Now, let's just skip it. So, what? Uh, moving on. Mother son relationship as theme. One of the minor themes against juxtaposed with the main theme is the uh, mother son relationship. This is the last theme of the uh, play, thankfully. Kate is a dominant figure in the Kate Chris relationship. Chris' closeness to his dad is more evident in the play All My Sons than with his mother, Kate, though he cares for his mother and she is a loving mother to him. Anne's visit to the Keller household makes Kate suspicious that she might have come to ma marry Chris. Here it's written wrong. Many, not many. It's Mary. Yeah, finally it's working. Yes. To marry Chris. Kate believes that Larry is alive and will return someday. Wait, let me try it again if it works here now. Ah, good. Uh, Kate believes that Larry is alive and will return someday and marry Anne. Both Anne and Chris try to explain to Kate that it is ridiculous to wa wait for a man who has been missing for three years. Kate had known that her husband was guilty of shipping the defective cylinder heads but had kept the secret to herself. She lives in an illusion that Larry is alive and will return someday. Her son Larry being very close to her heart, she cannot come to terms with his loss. Her irrational belief is beneficial for the family too and her false hope of his return strengthens her. Kate disagrees for the marriage of Chris and Anne because giving their cons giving her consent to their marriage would mean that she would have to accept Larry's death, which in turn would lead to the revelation of her husband's crime of killing 21 pilots, so she still wants to wait for L Larry's return. So basically what it means is that Kate thinks that Larry died as the consequences of his father's actions, right? Uh, because she believes that either he committed suicide due to the shame or he was directly killed by the aeroplane he was flying which had the defective slender heads too. Uh, of these two things, uh, she seems that one of uh, the two is very very plausible. That's why she believes that if Larry is actually dead then he has been killed by his father. But he, she comes into a state of self-deception that no, no, God does not let his son be killed by his father. So Larry has to be alive. Larry must be alive. This cannot be that Larry is dead or else uh, 
जो कैलर इज द कल्पिट बिहाइंड इफ्ट इफ दिस इज सो बट ऑब्वियसली शी डजेंट वॉन्ट हर हजबेंड टू बी द कल्पिट बिहाइंड हर सन स्टेच सो शी इंस्टेड गोज इन टू अ फॉर्म ऑफ सेल्फ डिनाइल एंड नो 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 नन ऑफ दिस इज लाइव लैरी स्टिल नन ऑफ दिस इज राइट लैरी इज स्टिल अलाइव her irrational belief is when uh, chris finds it ridic- ridiculous to wait for someone who has been missing in action for 3 years chris is of the opinion that his mother is simply harboring a wrong notion uh, harboring a wrong notion in his opinion she is the only woman in america who is still waiting for her son to return being aware of her husband's guilt in the case of supplying defective cylinder heads a worried kate asks chris to protect both her husband and herself uh, this she does when george comes to visit their house so th- that is the time when she asks chris to uh, protect both her husband and herself she fears that steve and george might reopen the case because on the last days of the trial steve dever persisted in alleging alleging uh in alleging in the court that keller had forced him to dispatch the defective cylinder heads to the army both chris and kate are living in a state of denial of keller's guilt as a result their viewpoints are different on many issues chris disagrees with kate's view of n being inwardly hostile to the keller family uh so kate uh, says to chris that uh, n might look love, uh, loving uh, to them on the outside but inside she is very hostile she does not like the family and wants revenge for her father and things like this but chris disagrees with this because uh, uh, while kate insists that n is still waiting for larry's return chris disagrees with her as he knows very well that n is in love with him Kate does not like the idea of Anne staying with him while her brother George leaves. She wants that both George and Anne should live together. Chris makes it clear to Kate that Anne was not going anywhere. Chris calls Frank insane, uh, Frank Lube. So he prophesied or he mostly believed in astrology and philosophy uh, and prophecy. Sorry, not philosophy of course. So uh, he says that on the day Larry went missing, it was his lucky day. so he did not die and he is still alive somewhere according to his astrology and then kate st- starts believing him kate also obviously kate is very happy and someone else is supporting her so she supports her in turn chris calls frank insane for believing in astrology and being certain that larry was alive while kate trusts frank and disagrees with chris Both Chris and Kate knew about the defective cylinder case but kept it to themselves trying to hide the fact from each other so that the family could function in harmony. Chris is suspicious of his mother's knowledge about the truth of the defective cylinder case, cylinder heads case when George accuses Kate of telling lies that her husband Keller had not suffered from illness in the last 15 years. so chris also gets suspicious uh, that maybe my father was involved in the case because uh, kate mistakenly lets out that george uh, that joe keller has been sick in the past 15 years so uh, chris also starts thinking that jo- if joe hasn't been sick in the past 15 years then how come he was sick when uh, he asked steve dever to uh, f- when uh, the case was held or uh, when steve dever dispatched the cylinder heads because none of them knew that he actually talked with steve dever and told him that i have flu and stuff 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 uh, they only knew that uh, they only knew two things first is that steve dever dispatched the cylinder heads and second thing is that joe keller had flu on that day because joe keller himself said that i had flu on that day and therefore i was home but now kate is saying that he hasn't been sick for the past 15 years so one of them has to be lying right chris is fear uh, and later his father modifies her statement saying that he had suffered from flu kate says that it had dipped her mind so then kate says that oh sorry it slipped my mind chris is furious to hear from his mother that she has packed ends bag so that she leaves with her brother george chris makes it clear to his mother that n would not be leaving and that if n did not have any place in this house he would go away from this uh, from his house as well Chris emphatically says that Larry is dead so he would marry Anne. Chris wants to so Chris then again forcefully says that no Larry is dead and he will marry Anne. Chris wants to go ahead with his marriage plan in spite of his mother telling him that she would not allow the marriage to take place and that everybody in the house must wait for Larry's return. 
hinting that Keller is responsible for Larry. So she again and again keeps on hinting, I guess, according to this book, that Larry, uh, if Larry died, it was because of Joe Keller. If Larry died, it was because of Joe Keller. So basically, everyone is compelled to think that if yeah, and Joe Keller, you seriously had something to do with it. Otherwise, why would she keep on singing it again and again all day? Well, the book is written in such a way i don't know what to think before writing these course books but this course book is obviously written in such a manner as if kate kept on singing all day that larry died because of his father larry died because of his father see any any person would be forced to think that joe keller obviously had something to do with that case and he is the main culprit anyone can anyone can guess it so chris wants to i don't think it was uh, so in the main play maybe it was just a one or two thing instance Chris wants to go ahead with his marriage plan in spite uh, Larry's dead. She says that if uh, that Larry is alive and that if Larry is dead, then Larry has been killed by Joe Keller. And a father never kills a son, therefore Larry must be alive. Taking cue for her statement, Chris asks his father about the case and Keller is forced to come out with the truth of the case. Kate's concern for, his, for her son is obvious in her restlessness following Chris' disappearance after Keller's acceptance of his guilt in the case. So, Chris went out for a drive after he had an argument of, with his father when Joe Keller finally revealed the truth and then, kill, uh, then Chris is seen to be restless. Advising her husband Joe, she asked him to tell Chris that he is ready to go to prison in order to pay for his guilt in the case. She is sure that it would satisfy Chris and he would forgive his father. Here Kate judges him wrongly. So create things that even if you just say that okay i admit my guilt and i'm ready to pay for it to go while well, by going to prison uh, she thinks that chris would not actually let her go to, let him go to prison and instead would forgive him that forget what happened i can't be able to uh, see you go to jail and stuff like that so kate here judges him wrongly kate acts as a mediator between keller and her son keller joe keller Keller, Joe Keller and her son after Chris refuses to talk to his father once he comes to know about Keller's fraud. Joe asks Kate to convey to Chris that he had spoiled Chris and that he should have let him earn his own livelihood from the time he was 10 years old to make him realize that it was not easy to make money in this world. So this is a parent giving excuses just like most of our parents do many times. Oh, I know this beforehand. Uh, sorry, I know this firsthand. To make him realize that it was not easy to make money in this world, he further says that he would not ask Chris forgiveness because he had committed the crime for the interest of his family. Talking about Chris's ideals, Kate says that for Chris, the interest of the nation were bigger than the family. Kate makes Chris feel guilty of his decision to marry Anne by reiterating that is repeating that Larry was alive and that Chris would never have a happy marital life. Marital life means marital life if he married Larry's fiance Anne. So she is trying to make him feel guilty. Wow, what a great mother. But what can I say? Maybe she was bound by the kind of situation she was in. Kate's disapproval for their marriage couples compels, compels me forces Anne to show Larry's letter written to her on the last day of his life. The contents of the letter do not shock Kate as she had been aware of her husband's complicity in the damaged slender head's case. Anne has to snatch the letter from her in order to show it to Chris as Kate tries to prevent Chris from reading the letter. Chris reads Larry's letter that is the proof of the circumstances in which Larry had killed himself. So joe keller too didn't know about larry's letter or while joe uh, why larry was killed until now or whether larry was actually killed or not either or dead or not joe keller asked chris to drive him to the authorities so that he can surrender himself chris reads larry's letter that is the proof of the huh. pleading with chris not to hand him to the authorities she says that if chris would take keller to jail he would be killing joe this is kate saying this to chris Trying to save her husband from going to jail, she conveniently tells Chris that Larry's letter had no meaning as the war was over. Chris then asks his mother if Larry was not important to her anymore. So he asks that now that it has come to this, uh, Larry is not important to you anymore. He was only important as long as uh, father was not involved in this crime. Or as long as uh, it was to stop uh, Chris from marrying Anne. Now Larry has no importance. 
He makes both Joe and Kate realize that it is not enough to feel sorry. They should have a certain responsibility to our society and the nation. Kate had all this while kept repeating that Larry is alive in order to conceal her husband's guilt. And once Larry's letter comes out with the truth, she begins pleading with Chris not to take her husband away because he would not live long. After her husband shoots himself inside the house, now Kate suddenly changes and uh, becomes and takes the authoritative figure here because she uh, knows what her responsibilities are. Instead of grieving and crying for her uh, dead husband, she consoles Chris like a loving mother, telling him not to take the blame on himself. She asks him to be strong, to forget the past and to look forward to the future. Personally, I think this Kate character was very suspicious and she wasn't a very good character either. But the rest, I'll leave on you all. So let us sum up in this unit. We have discussed the theme all my sons in detail after main issues that Arthur Metric converse to us. So none of this is important, right? And again, like always, I advise you to do the exercise part this as it is very important major theme of the major theme you already know the first question that major theme is social responsibility actions and their consequences you can do this how the character of chris contrary to this father this is also very easy we will discuss the various themes of the play or my sense now when you are given such a question as the question number four then this should be of i guess around 20 marks though i do not trust IGNU authorities at all they i don't know what they do with the exam but the exam is completely crappy so uh they can just mess it up again but uh i think that such questions as question number four should be of 20 marks each so you can write uh four of the themes uh as per five marks each of them so that would make your 20 marks just write about four themes and each of them should have at least a five marks description so that would make you 20 marks then until now let's until the next chapter okay